Hello, everyone, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity to share with you around the leading projects in the smart technology era. And over the next 40 or 45 minutes, I would like to take you on a journey. And then toward the end, we would obviously take some questions and answers. And I really am very interested in your questions or comments for that matter. So please, during the, the talk, please add your questions and your comments so that we can look at that when we get to the um, end of my talk. So the title of my talk, as you can see there on the screen, is Leading Projects in the Smart Technology Era. And allow me, if you would, to just quickly tell you the flow and, and what I will be covering during this talk. Firstly, I would like to just spend a very few minutes on marketing, if you would, just telling you a little bit about me and, and how you can follow the work that I'm doing. Then I want to talk specifically about this so-called smart technology era and what does that mean? Then I want to also take you on a tour of the history of artificial intelligence. You know, it is such a misunderstood technology. Perhaps you yourself might feel you don't know all that much about it. But I can bet you that a lot of your colleagues, a lot of your customers and stakeholders will also not know all that much about it. There's a great deal of confusion, a great deal of hype about this technology. And then I want to get to what is the future of project management, even the smart technology era, and how must we prepare ourselves and what could we anticipate? And then lastly, I'll just conclude and then in the last few minutes, as I have said, open up to some of your questions and comments. So before I start, just a little bit about myself. I work for PwC as a lead automation architect here in Johannesburg in South Africa. But I do not speak on behalf of PwC. However, I do speak on behalf of the IIT PSA, and that is the Institute of information technology professionals of South Africa, where I lead both the regional chapter committee, and I also look after the special interest group on AI and robotics. And if you wanna see more about me, my bio, if you wanna read the articles that I'm writing, look at some of the other talks I'm doing, then please go over to my website, aiforbusiness.net. There you will also be able to see my email details, my LinkedIn and my Twitter profile. So I invite you to go over to that site and I also invite you to contact me and to connect with me on Twitter, email or on LinkedIn. Lastly, you will also on my website find my podcast. It's on Spotify and on Amazon and on all the other or most of the other platforms where you can uh, listen to some of the talks that I'm doing. And also on my website, you will be able to read the articles that I'm writing. Every week I write for a piece for Business Day, a local uh, business newspaper. I also write for some financial publications like Fin Week and some IT publications like um, IT Web and Brainstorm. So go have a look and read um, articles. And again, make contact with me on my website and I've Love to hear what you think about some of these articles. You know, over the last six months, I've published nearly 40 articles in these publications. So I do write quite a bit. And I think it would be to your benefit to read those articles. And I would love to hear what you think about them. So let me start off by talking about what is the smart technology era. Normally, when I do talks like these to clients or at conferences, I start by showing them three different pictures. And I say, which of these pictures, in your view, reminds you the most or resonates to you when you think about artificial intelligence? The first picture I show is this one, the evil robot. And some of you might remember it from the Terminator movie. It's a robot that is destroying, that is got, that's got weapons, that doesn't really think about human beings. Some people might think that robots are like this because they are misunderstood. We don't quite know what it means for us in our future. And it definitely is a threat to our employment. 
we hear a lot about automation and, and we think, will we have a job in the future? So the first picture I show people is this one, an evil robot and say, when you think about artificial intelligence, is this the picture that comes to mind? The second picture I show my audience normally is this one of just a cute little robot. It is a helper. It is not a threat. It's there to make your life and your job better. And I ask the audience, do you think that this picture best resonates with you when you think about artificial intelligence? It is not a threat. It is something that could really help us. And then lastly, I show my audience a picture of just computer code, like you can see here on the screen. And then I go back and I say, think now of the three pictures I've just showed you. I've showed you the evil robot. I've showed you a friendly robot. And now I'm showing you a picture of computer code. Which of these three pictures reminds you most of your idea of artificial intelligence? And I want you right now to think about that. Is it an evil robot? a friendly robot, or is it computer code? And of course, the answer is that it is computer code. A lot of people have a very bad image of artificial intelligence. A lot of this has to do with the media, with Hollywood movies, with all the hype and all the threats. Uh, we, we learned that AI has already been weaponized through drones, and, and that is a reality. And through this talk, I'm gonna to touch a bit on ethics and privacy and philosophy and things like that. So the future of us and of our children will be impacted by this technology, but we still have time as a collective and as a community to make sure that we steer this technology in the right direction. But I normally start my talks with these three pictures just to set the tone. Are we talking about the same thing? If you think it's an evil robot, you're gonna fear it, you're gonna avoid it. If you, if you think it's just a nice friendly robot, your expectations might be wrong, but when you realize it's code created by humans, and even if it's machine learning and the like, right now we as humans are creating this technology. And for now, at least, we can control it. So when you think about your own future and your own job as a program or a project manager, approach this topic with hope. Think of how this technology can help you rather than fearing it and fearing that it might take your job away one day. And then normally when I talk about the smart technology era, I say, how does computers or how can computers and algorithms already do the things that we as humans and as human workers can do? And I normally highlight four things. And the first one, as you can see there on the screen, is that these kind of systems can see. Here we talk about optical character recognition, or these days we talk about intelligent optical character recognition, OCR, that can read not only structured documents like purchase orders or quotes, it can also read often these days unstructured documents like handwritten documents. And this is where we talk about computer vision. Computers can already see. We as workers, we see, we look at an email or an instruction and then we do something about that. And the doing something about it talks all about execution. And there we talk about smart automation. You might have heard of robotics, process automation, or Gartner speaks about hyper automation. More and more these days, we also hear about intelligent automation where the likes of machine learning and artificial intelligence and predictive models becomes part of your process automation um, kind of initiatives, but not only do we as humans see and then, but secondly, we execute, we action something. Computers can see, as I've already said, and computers can, and algorithms can already action what they see based on certain perimeters. Not only do we execute the tasks, but we also understand language. When you read an email or a memo or an instruction, you understand not only the physical language, the English or whatever language it is written in that you can understand. We also read the meaning behind the language, sentiment. And these days we get a lot of this in natural language understanding, or natural language processing. Think here of the likes of conversational, artificial intelligence or chatbots. 
if you use Siri, if you use something like your Google Home or Alexa, then this voice technology can understand what we're saying, but it also understands more and more the meaning behind what we are saying. Think of the application in call centers, for instance, before a call is transferred to a human call center agent, by interacting with a customer, it can already pick up sentiment like, is this a frustrated customer, an angry customer? What is the question that, or questions that the customer is trying to ask? As humans, in other words, we can see, but we also understand language and computer technology can also do that. And then lastly, computers and computing technology can also learn. We see, we execute, we understand language or the intent behind the instruction. But we as humans also learn. And these days we talk a lot, as you know, about machine learning, pattern recognition. So not only can a machine learning module understand what you are saying as a customer, it can also base that on the millions of other interactions it's had. And it can start basing the way it services you on the patterns that it has seen. So as part of the smart technology era, think of these four main things that we as human workers typically do, and that smart technology can already do these days. And the way it does it, the accuracy, the, the speed with which it will do it, will increase exponentially every day into the future. And then last slide on what is smart, what is the smart technology era? A few icons just to touch on. What has made it possible that we live in this time of smart technology? The first one, and you can see there the picture of the computer chip. Computer processing power has exponentially increased over the last years. If you have a smartphone, then you have more computing power in your pocket than were in computers just a few years ago. Example I like to use is, you know, the, the Apollo mission that took men to the moon in the late 60s. There's a lot more computing power in your little smartphone than they had on that spaceship or that module with which they traveled to the moon and back. So one of the reasons why we live in the smart technology era is the increase, exponential increase in computing power. Secondly is also cloud computing. Cloud computing, you know, I always like or laugh at the name when, when people who are not technical talk about it. Why a cloud? What does it mean somewhere up in the sky? And then I explain, well, essentially, you're just using somebody else's computer somewhere else in the world. And here we think of the likes of Oracle or Microsoft Azure or Amazon AWS or other firms even. It is so easy now, rather than to get all this expensive equipment to use in your own office, you can, on a consumption basis, utilize huge computing power that is not on your premises, that is a lot safer than it would have been on your own premises. And also the cost is so much lower because you only pay for what you use. Thirdly is this era of artificial intelligence and machine learning based on the increased computing power, based on, on um, cloud computing and, and the, the easy access that almost any one of us can have to incredible systems and computing power out there. And then lastly is really, and, and here I just have a little picture of a decision tree, but it's about autonomy. Autonomy means a human is not in the loop. And this is quite a controversial topic. So if machine learning models based on all this processing power can learn and can make decisions autonomously without human intervention. Now, this is already to some extent possible, but think of where this can go into the future. On the one hand, it can be really good because you don't need humans who are often slow. I mean, we are sick sometimes, we take leave, we go and strike, we are unionized. These models can do it without us, but also think of what it can do to us when it comes to future employability. Um, so it's, this is quite a big topic, but this is just a slide maybe to conclude on this first element, this first really scene setting of my talk, the smart technology era. It is here. Yes, there is a lot more hype than reality, but don't be fooled. It is enhancing and changing and growing daily. If we understand it, and if we use it wisely, it could really benefit us. 
We don't all have to become AI or machine learning or cloud experts. If you're a program or a project manager, you have to understand the basics of this technology. When your customers talk to you about the internet of things or machine learning or the like, you have to understand what they mean. You also have to understand how this technology will impact your, the management of your projects, the management of your staff and their future careers, and also your customer expectations. So one of the big things I want to leave with you today during this talk is to understand that you don't have to fear this technology and also you don't have to become an expert. There are so many free resources, whether it's YouTube videos or free online training or books. There's no excuse really for any of us to keep on learning and to keep on upskilling ourselves every day. One of the big topics that I've already alluded to when it comes to the smart technology era is the impact it will have on humans. And a term, as you see there on the screen, that I like to use is not robotics, but cobotics. In other words, humans working with smart technology or robots in order to achieve certain things. And, and change management and culture and um, even design thinking is an important element here. We should never embrace or, or tackle this technology purely on, on a tech or a platform basis. Think of the fears that people might have. Think of the pushback that we might get from people based on the hype of this technology. If we can prove to our teams and even to our customers that smart technology can help us as humans be better at what we do. For instance, to no longer do the stupid mundane tasks that we all hate doing because robotic process automation or other kind of technologies can do that. Once the word starts spreading in the organization that I'm enjoying my job more because the things I normally hated doing, like reporting or answering calls and queries, is now being automated. And I can focus on the things that I'm really good at. That is important. So this idea of cobotics is an incredibly important concept as we approach this technology. Uh, for you as, a, as an individual and as a business leader, but also for the teams that you work with or the teams that's, that are working for you and for your customers. We have to always set the scene that smart technology, this smart technology era can really benefit us. Now, yes, if we don't control it, if we approach it wrong, it can be very detrimental to humans. But that doesn't mean that that has to happen. We can control it to make sure that it serves us, not just in our daily jobs, but also society. So think of the uh, positive applications in educating our children and our young people. Think of the already very uh, practical applications to healthcare. There's a lot of good we can do as a collective, as humanity with this technology, but we also need to make sure that it doesn't fall into the wrong hands, that people not only commit electronic warfare, but physically war physical warfare through weaponizing this technology, which is unfortunately already a reality. AI is very misunderstood. Almost every one of my customers that I have dealt with over the last two or three years have misunderstood it. And again, it's because of all the hype and all the things we see in the news media, read in the newspapers, the things we're talking about as colleagues and as friends. So when your customers or your colleagues, your team members, your stakeholders start talking about AI, machine learning, the internet of things, and all these other concepts, cloud computing and so forth, maybe just always pause. I do this and it helps me a lot. I say, just before we go on, tell me what you meant through what you've just said. And more often than not, I realize that a lot of people are just using terms that they've heard maybe to seem a bit smarter than they think they are, and that's human nature. But, be, be, but in order to understand your customers and your stakeholders and your team, we have to make sure we are on the same level. People will still talk about robotic process automation, which is a fairly, in my opinion, dumb technology because, yes, it can do what we program it to do very quickly and very accurately, but it doesn't learn. It's not intuitive. A lot of people still think that robotic process automation is the same as artificial intelligence. So a customer might, for instance, say, 
just bring us a few robots to fix this problem. And that's when I then say, tell me what you mean when you say a few robots. So I, I sometimes think that half or maybe two thirds of my job as I interact with my customers is to, in my own way, educate them and to make sure we're talking about the same thing. But do not underestimate how much this kind of technology is misunderstood. Even in IT departments, where people should be very aware of this technology, even if they are at a senior level, like a chief information officer or a digital um, or divisional digital officer or something like that, you might be surprised how many people misunderstand it. And that's, again, one of the reasons why we should upskill ourselves, understand the basics of this technology so that when people start using these terms and speaking about these concepts, that we understand what they are saying, that we are also able to correct them and guide them in the right way. Artificial intelligence, in contrast to most new technologies, has gone through several hype cycles. An initial period of exuberance about the possibilities, followed by a period of realism checking and disappointment. And these are called the so-called AI winters. If you Google it, you will read about it. But there's often a winter before the next breakthrough. Human learning, according to psychologist Edward Thorndike, is caused by previously unknown property of neural connections in the brain. And in 1932, when he worked at the University of Columbia, he first published this theory. And his idea was expanded even more by another psychologist called Donald Hebb at the University of Chicago, who claimed as early on as 1949 that learning entails increasing the probability or the weight of induced neuron firing between link connections in certain brain activity patterns. A lot of our hardware models of the brain have been constructed based on the research of these academics and many others. So a big part of what we understand today are as artificial intelligence and neural networks and the like is based on this early foundational work on researching how the human brain works. This hypothesis is called the so-called computational theory of mind or CTM. And it assumes that the human mind is a computational system with thought processes similar to what we currently recognize as software running on a digital computer. In 1936, the famous code breaker in the Second World War, Alan Turing, came up with what was eventually called the Turing machine. It is a mathematical model of physical devices that could do at that time almost any computation. Many saw it as a path to get to artificial intelligence, but Turing said it was his machine and his thinking and his research was foundational to natural intelligence. And there on the screen, you can also see a logo of Apple computer Many of us use, use Macs or iPhones. And here's an interesting little piece of info, maybe even conspiracy theory. You know, Alan Turing, back in the day, he was a gay man and they, he was prosecuted by the then British society and government. And they, he eventually actually put poison into an apple and ate the apple. And that's how he committed suicide. And when they found his body, there was this apple lying on the ground with a bite out of it. And many wonder when the original founders of Apple, Steve Jobs and, and his team, whether they used this idea of Turing biting an apple because his ideas were not always accepted and because he lived such a, a non-conformist life, whether they used that to, to create the logo of Apple. We'll never know, but that's quite an interesting little bit of information. The development of digital computers that could run the first so-called intelligent computer programs resulted in a lot of work on CTM in the 1950s. And this computer was called the Ferranti Mark I at the University of Manchester. And it was the first to, con to actually run AI algorithms in 1951. And if given enough time, it could complete fairly in time a game of draughts with a human component. Now we've all heard about AlphaGo and IBM's Deep Blue and the like, but around about the 1996, Deep Blue actually beat one of the best chess players in the world. 
and AlphaGo would, would have that famous victory as, as early as 2015. And, and I mean, you, yeah, you can see the picture of the AlphaGo Netflix documentary. It's incredible. But if, again, if you think of where this technology came all the way through to Turing and others to now, which is still fairly a narrow task, is to beat somebody at chess or at the game Go. And that's really the thing. AI is still quite narrow, even when it is really good at some of these narrow tasks. Research on AI was supported by governments over all these years, uh, primarily focused on language processing from about the 1950s through to the 1970s. And for automatic language translation, perception networks were considered to be the best option. Large sums of money were wasted trying to get a system that could handle the complexity of language in the first place. And then we got to what they called these AI winters. And during this first winter, which lasted all the way into the 1980s, interest in this connectionist approach in AI waned. And we've seen these winters twice throughout the last few years. Expert or knowledge-based systems continued to be developed until the 1990s, but it became evident that they did not represent true artificial intelligence. And commercial use dwindled due to the difficulties and the time necessary of transforming human expertise into the knowledge base. As early as the 1970s, scientists recognized that a single simulated neural layer, that's now in our brains, could only detect a small number of well-specified things, each of which was evaluated to confirm the neuron output prior to each activation function. And was unique. Classifications could grow even more sophisticated with the addition of a second or a hidden layer of neurons. And this is how our brains work. We have these multiple layers of neurons firing instructions. And that's why the human brain is such an amazing thing. Multi-layer neural networks provided the foundation for what is currently called deep learning. Finally, everyone thought that machines as complex as the human brain as well as sentient robots could be produced. Networks are growing in size as a result of the latest generation of multi-core processes and the resurgence of connectivism. By the 2000s, despite all the advancements in hardware technology, the traditional AI disillusionment had set in again, and it became clear that deep learning was still incapable of constructing an intelligent robot. These days we talk about artificial narrow intelligence, which means, as I've already alluded to, that this technology in a narrow way at a very specific task can be very good playing chess, handling invoices and so forth. But when it comes to artificial general intelligence, which is what we are as humans, we can think of and do multiple things at multiple times. We don't always have to focus on a very narrow task. That that so-called AGI, or Artificial General Intelligence, is still into the future. There's still a fair bit of disagreement between thinkers and academics about when we will reach general intelligence or general artificial intelligence. Some say in the next five or ten years, others say in the next 50 years, but I, I guess it is coming. But time will only tell when that will happen. So lastly, on this tour of what is artificial intelligence, where have we come from and where are we going? Allow me to briefly touch on some of the challenges that we are facing now and into the future of artificial intelligence. And the first one that you've most likely heard of a lot is that of bias, which means that being human, we embed into the code without knowing it, certain biases. And a good example here is that of facial recognition, which is which really, more than any other smart technology platform, reveals how much bias we have built into the system. We've seen over the last few months, or last year even, the amount of riots in the likes of the United States because of wrongful policing and wrongful arrests, because facial recognition technology really struggles to accurately pick up and identify the faces of females and of people with darker skin tones. And the simple reason for that is it's a bunch of white guys like me 
in Silicon Valley who created these algorithms. Mm. Now, some people do it with intending for harm, but I think a lot of people creating these platforms just don't realize how much bias we've built into it. But think of bias now when it comes to not only policing and wrongful arrests, which is a very serious topic, but think of um, facial recognition technology being used for you when you apply for finance or for credit. And those biases could determine that you don't get the loan that you qualify for because you are a female or you are of the wrong ethnicity. Think of healthcare, which is even more important. When we use AI more and more to diagnose certain illnesses, what if we have put biases into those platforms that would inaccurately determine how to treat a patient that could lead to more suffering or death? Very big issue now and into the future is that of ethics or philosophy for that matter. I've read that two of the greatest jobs in the mind in the future of this smart technology era will be that of ethicists and philosophers. And I often use the example of the birth control pill. You know, in the 1950s and 60s, this was really frowned upon by a lot of people because they thought we are playing God. How can we take control of our bodies or, or women for that matter and determine whether we fall pregnant or not? A lot of people then and some now have religious objections about it. But these days, many of us as couples we use birth control pills and we don't even think about it. It's just a normal part of our lives. And what I try to illustrate here is whenever these new advancements come about, initially it is often a very ethically controversial issue until we've spent some time thinking about it, debating about it. And then in time, it becomes a normal part of life. The smart technology era will bring more and more issues that will really challenge our ethics. Think, for instance, of designer babies. And this is already a possibility, but it needs to be regulated. What if we use the genetical coding in the male and in the female to actually program out certain dispositions like cancer or heart disease? But what if we also can design the baby? So for instance, we might say we want a, a baby boy who is six foot three with brown eyes and a great physique. And what do we do with the people who don't have the, the finances and the means to design their own babies? Think of the Nazis in the Second World War, because they killed a lot of people that they called undesirable, like the Jews or Freemasons or gypsies or people with certain physical ailments. So think ethically of what the future of this technology can do if we don't regulate it. Privacy is, of course, a hot topic, and it has been for a number of years. In Europe, we think of GDPR. Here in South Africa, we have POPIA, the Protection of Personal Information Act, and other legislation across the world. But the way we use people's personal data in an ethical way that will serve them, that will not destroy them or, or be for their harm, is a massively important topic in the smart technology era. And then, as I've already alluded to, job displacements through smart automation. You know, and, and that's where cobotics come in again, which I've referenced earlier. But what if the smart automation platforms become so smart that there's no way that we can actually reskill our people, which will mean millions, billions of people may end up with our jobs. You can read books like authors by Yuval Harari and others. They speak of us creating the so-called useless class, which means that if this technology is not controlled or regulated in the future, we might end up with a small amount of people on earth having great wealth, great access to healthcare. But most people in the world will not have not only good healthcare, but not have any jobs. So think of the societal upheaval that that can cause into the future. This is serious stuff and we have to think about it. We have to debate it. We cannot sweep it under the rug as if it will not happen. Next, I really want to bring it home from a project management point of view. In the future, technological advancements will have significant impact on project management. And AI or artificial intelligence will undoubtedly change how project management tasks 
are being delivered and controlled. AI is on its way in becoming more than just a tool for automating repetitive tasks. Today, these terms of AI and automation are frequently used interchangeably. However, there is a significant difference. Automation is a controlled process that adheres to pre-programmed logic and rules, whereas artificial intelligence is intended to simulate intelligent and even human thinking. And to date, much of the emphasis has been on the automation of pre-existing tasks, which necessitates some degree of standardization. But when it comes to the integration of automation, common project tasks are already heavily emphasized or simplifying and automating via workflow integration and process automation. Even budget forecasting reports can be generally automated with no or, or very little administrative interaction required when updating a project's budget in the database. Another way to improve project planning is to use programmed logic and rules to enable auto scheduling, which automatically tracks the progress and status of activities completed by a project team. Using incident management in conjunction with project planning tools can help reveal delays that may cause a large number of problems in a particular set of work streams that are being addressed simultaneously. Machine learning will play a significant role in project management. Predictive analytics powered by machine learning can advise project managers on how to set up and steer the project based on its unique characteristics and how to react to specific difficulties and dangers in order to achieve the best potential outcome based on previous successful projects. With artificial intelligence, project managers' mind maps may be translated to a somatic network from which tasks and relationships can be deduced. For example, AI-based project scheduling may include lessons learned from previous projects and generate a variety of plausible sh schedules based on the context and dependencies. And additionally, project plans may be updated in real time, utilizing historical data regarding team activities and project success. Through real-time analytics of project data, an AI system may even alert a project manager to potential hazards and possibilities. I anticipate that uh, project assistants will continue to conduct fundamental project management responsibilities and relieve project teams of repetitive low value work. Project management in this scenario will heavily use currently available and future human computer interface technologies. Project managers in charge of a PMO and its staff will gradually be replaced by intelligent project assistants. In the future, machine learning based project management may expand to encompass autonomous project management. There's that word again. Remember I mentioned it right in the beginning, autonomous, no human in the loop. Humans will eventually have responsibility for project budgets, portfolios, amongst other things to manage the risk associated with autonomous investment decisions. It is also vital to evaluate the benefits of an AI system that it can bring to projects, as well as your business culture and risk tolerance. Do you only want a digital assistant to do menial tasks for you? Or do you want something more, more complex and thorough in its evaluation of the project? Project managers will continue to have a crucial role in the age of artificial intelligence. As long as they focus on the fundamental skills of project management and progressively shift into roles that place a higher premium on human qualities. In the near future, there will be a significant increase in projects to implement AI based platforms. The project management community will play a vital role, but they also need to focus on their skills in this field. AI may not replace humans but it may replace project managers who are not skilled in this technology. This brings us to the end of this talk. I hope you um, appreciate it and learned from it. Uh, there's a lot that I mentioned and I would like to think that this recording will be made available, but just maybe to conclude, think of the history of AI and where we are today. Think of the AI winters. Think of all the hype and where AI 
we might go, but we're not quite there yet. Think of job displacements. Think of taking your people on the journey with you. Think of the fact that, of what I said here toward the end that AI will not replace project managers, but it might replace those who don't know how to use AI technology. So just to, to conclude, I want to encourage you to keep on doing the good work you're doing. Keep on learning, keep on thinking, keep on debating, keep on challenging one another because this technology is really here to stay. We have to learn to live with it and use it and make our lives better. Or we have to, to suffer the consequences of not upskilling ourselves. With that, I'd like to again thank the conference organizers. This was a great privilege. I look forward to listening in to all the other speakers and to learn from their opinions and comments and experience. And uh, now what I'd like to do is just to, to maybe look at some of the questions in the chat and attend to them. Thank you so much.